That minus sign is going to make the numerator smaller and make you have a, a lower uh, Doppler shifted frequency. Okay, and notice one more thing. If the actual speed of your detector goes to zero, in other words, if I'm running, but then I stop, V sub D goes to zero, and I'm left with V over V, which is just one, so this whole thing comes to one, and so the Doppler shifted frequency is exactly equal to the original frequency you had. It's only because of the magic of these fractions that actually cause the frequency to be shifted. Uh, cal calculationally. So you really need to, to, to think about that as you do your problems. If I'm running towards a source, I should hear a higher frequency. If I'm running away from a source, I should hear a lower frequency and choose the, uh, the proper sign. All right, let's go off to case two. Let me go ahead and circle this. This is one of the ones you'll see in your book. Let me go to case two. And we've already covered that one with words. Case two means uh, what happens if I have a source that moves and a detector is stationary. Source moves, detector is stationary. And if I wanted to draw a picture of that, let's say I had a source and let's say it's actually moving because that's what we're talking about and it has a V sub S. So I'm going to differentiate it with a, a sub s, and you have to get your subscripts right or you're going to get yourself confused. If it's moving this direction, I think you can convince yourself that the wave fronts are going to kind of be cramped in the front here and kind of spread out behind, right? Because the source is really ramming itself into its own crest and its own trough. So it's creating these pressure disturbances, but it's racing towards them. So it's kind of compressing them in front. And so anytime you have a compression like that, you're basically going to be emitting a higher frequency than you otherwise would because this is a shorter wavelength, right? Remember, inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. If I have a very short wavelength, I'm gonna have a much higher frequency, a higher pitch. And the reverse is true. Here on this side, I would have a, uh, a, a longer wavelength, and so I would have a higher frequency. Uh, I'm sorry, a lower frequency on this side. So, without any further proof, the frequency that's going to be Doppler shifted is going to be equal to exactly the same thing as before, but it's going to look a little bit different on the inside. You have V over V minus plus V sub S. And I'll go ahead and circle that. Notice it looks sort of similar to the other case, and it really does perform the same function. Basically, if the, this is the speed of sound in air, just like it was before. This is the frequency, the normal undisturbed frequency that you really are sending out of the source. Now notice, if your source is actually um, uh, not moving at all, let's say you put zero in here, then what you're going to have here is V over V, which is one, which means this whole thing would go to one, and the Doppler shifted frequency would not be any different than the frequency that you emitted. And I have a little detector over here, obviously, and these compressed uh, you know, wave fronts are hitting it, and so I'm going to hear, in this case, a higher frequency than I otherwise would. And you should know that from your experience. This is the train example. This is when I have a detector, which is me, the train is coming towards me, and it's compressing its own wave fronts, and I hear that higher pitch. And as it passes me, you've got to think that in your head, right? I should be hearing a higher frequency as a source approaches me, right? So what you need to do is use that knowledge to choose the proper sign here to give you a higher frequency, okay? So think about that. If this is just a number and this is just a number and this is just a number, how do I get a, a larger Doppler shifted frequency. The only way I could do that is if I chose a negative sign down here because that would make the denominator smaller. You have to think about this with me. The denominator would get smaller if I subtracted these numbers, which would make this fraction larger, which would make this number larger as well. So I would have to choose a negative sign. Now if my detector were over here, let's say, so forget about this, and I just put the detector over here on the other side, right here, so the, the train is racing away from me, you know, and now it's over there and I, I hear that lower frequency. I know from my experience I should hear a lower frequency. How do I choose the proper sign to have a lower frequency here? The only way I can do that is to put a plus sign here because that would make this denominator bigger, which would make this fraction smaller, which would make my Doppler shifted frequency smaller. So both of these cases really, really do rely on your intuition. You need to think about which way it's going, and that's very, very instructive for you to draw a picture to help you with that. Think about your trains. 
it's going to be you to choose the proper sign here to basically raise or lower the frequency appropriately. And once you have the hang of it, you're never going to have a Doppler shift problem that you can't figure out because they're really all the same after a while. Now, I told you in the beginning that most books are going to give you this, and they'll say, here's case one and here's case two. And then they'll lead you to believe that you'll have to really use both of these all the time. But in fact, there's actually a Doppler shift formula that encompasses both of these. In other words, in this case, the detector was the only thing moving. In this case, the source was the only thing moving. There is a Doppler shift equation that takes both into account with the source and the detector moving. And once I show you how to use that, it'll be much easier for you to actually latch onto that one and use it in all of your problems because you'll never get confused. If you start trying to memorize these, I mean, maybe you'll do fine, but if you start trying to memorize them and if you memorize them wrong, maybe you flip something around because you get them confused, you're just going to get the wrong answer. If I show you how to use the granddaddy equation, you'll never get the wrong answer. So let's go ahead and talk about case three, which is the granddaddy equation, is what I like to call it. But if you're going to write it down, it would be source moves, source and detector, both move. And these are the problems, actually, when they both move that can confuse people. OK? So that would be the case where, just, you know, just to draw it, uh, you know, you'd have some some guy moving you know like this so so some source is moving along like this and then you might have some you know detector maybe as a person on a bicycle or is walking or something like that and maybe this guy right here is actually moving towards the source or he could be moving away from the source so the detector is moving toward the source, and so you have both things going on at the same time. What would the Doppler shift look like there? It's going to look, in fact, very similar. It's the original frequency emitted by the source, undisturbed, multiplied by the following thing. Let me just write it down. V plus minus V sub D over V minus plus V sub S. This is what I've been referring to as the granddaddy equation. This is the only one that I really think you're ever going to have to memorize. If you memorize that one, you'll have no need to memorize these other ones. Because if you look at them, they really do look like, if you were to take these two and kind of overlap them on top of each other, it looks like they would kind of encompass them, and in fact they do. If you take the detector as not moving, so put a zero here, put a, put a zero here, then you get V over V plus VS. So if the detector is uh, the detector is not moving, you're going to get this guy right here, which is exactly uh, what we said. And if you have the source, which is not moving, which is this guy right here, and the detector is the only thing moving, you're going to get this, which is exactly what we wrote here. So really, if you just use this problem, and if the detector or the source happen to be stationary, just put a zero in the appropriate place, you'll always get the right answer, and you'll never get confused. And there will only be one equation to memorize or to write down your, your little uh, sheet for your test. So again, it's going to be up to you when you do your problems to choose the sign appropriately in the numerator and the, the uh, denominator. And I'm going to reiterate it as we do our problems, but there's one thing that I really, really, really want you to really remember. I'm going to say it again. Really, I want you to remember this as you work your problems. When you choose these signs, choose them independently of one another. In other words, and we'll do this as we do the problems, if you're trying to choose the sign in the top, I want you to pretend that the source, in other words, this is involving the detector moving. You have to pretend that the source is not moving at all as you make this decision. Okay? And then as you work on the bottom sign, where all, you're talking about the contribution of what's happening because the source is moving, you need to pretend that the detector is not moving at all to choose this sign. Right? Choose them independently of one another because what you're going to have is cases when when um, you know the source is moving and the detector are moving and you're trying to think, well, is that going to raise or lower the frequency? What's going to happen is you're going to have a contribution from both. If the source is moving toward the detector, it's going to try to raise the frequency. If the detector is trying to move away from the source, it might try to lower the frequency. And so in order to wrap your brain around that, you're never going to get anywhere if you try to combine everything at once. You need to think about them independently. What is the source trying to do? The fact that the source is moving. Choose the sign appropriately. What is happening because the detector is trying to move? Choose that sign appropriately. And then once you have those signs in place, it's a simple math problem. And um, as we do our problems here, you, you know, don't get too worried about this. We're going to do enough problems where you're going to feel comfortable. Let's go ahead and erase the board, 
and do some Doppler shift problems.